Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth webinar on the Good Practice Database. Today we will be focusing specifically on using innovative financed instruments for ambitious climate action. And I want to just start by thanking everyone for taking the time um, to join this webinar. For some of us, it's quite late at night um, and some of us early in the morning. So it's fantastic to see so many faces on the line, so to speak. Before we start, I just wanted to do a little bit of an introduction. My name is Allison Toll. I am the program specialist with the NDC support program at the United Nations Development Program based in New York. Um, today, we will be going over just a very brief welcome and housekeeping, um, just so that we make sure that everyone understands the platform that we're using for the webinar. I'm also going to go into an introduction of what the Good Practice Database is, which is what started this series of webinars. And I'm very happy to say that we have presentations of good practice examples from both British Columbia on scaling up ambition and the lessons that are learned from the carbon tax in British Columbia, as well as our colleagues in Fiji that will be introducing their pioneering green finance in the development world. We will end these presentations with a question and answer session um, with everyone available to take part in um, so that the attendees can actually ask direct questions to the presenters um, if they would like more information or clarification on anything that they presented either in their presentation or in the case study that's part of the good practice database. Uh, I will also just take an opportunity to lead you to where you can find the previous three webinar series in case you're interested in hearing more and learning more. So just to make sure that we all understand the platform that we're using, um, as you can see when you signed in, this is a Zoom webinar platform. Um, if you're experiencing any questions or technical difficulties, I would suggest that you type anything that's going on into the question box that you have at the bottom of your screen. We have a group of um, colleagues from Adelphi that are in the background supporting this. Um, they've also supported on the front end as well. They should be able to address any issues that you have, um, hopefully help out, or if in fact there's a reason that there's something wrong with my um, uh, voice or, or my, the clearance of my voice, they'll be able to tell me as well. I'm happy to let everyone know that there's a recording of this webinar today. Um, this will be posted and made available to everyone afterwards on the POTPA site, um, as well as the UNDP site, um, and we can be sharing it through a thank you email afterwards. So that's in case you had any colleagues that were interested or you learned something here that you thought was interesting and you wanted to share it with others um, among your units. Finally, um, just to start, I think um, I want to give just a, a background on what brought us here today. Um, the Good Practice Database is a central hub for case studies on learning and leadership in climate action. It actually started a number of years ago with, um, with GIZ colleagues and UNDP where we've said, you know, there's a lot of learning that's taking place, but there's not a lot of sharing of that learning across um, countries and across ministries. We're doing a lot of work, but not really capturing what's taking place and sharing it with others so that people can learn and actually use those good practices in their own countries. So we developed the first um, good practice analysis, which set out very specific criteria for, um, for case studies to be monitored against, and then developed 20 case studies that then turned into 40 case studies that became the good practice database. Last year, we partnered up with colleagues in the NDC partnership, as well as LEDS Global Partnership, to make sure that we could make this global database a larger sum of its parts and bring in case studies from all over. We recognized that there are a lot of different implementing organizations that were learning um, through the work that was taking place and in the countries. Um, and we wanted to be able to have one place that wasn't confusing, but where people could find all of the information and all of the good practice that, that, had, that were out there. Um, so this became an easily searchable repository of good practice examples. 
um, the cases where climate action is being effectively designed and implemented, meaning that, that we're looking at how people are planning climate action and then also how they're actually going in and implementing it. And I think important in the good practice database is that we also don't just focus on what's been done well, but we look at what the obstacles were and what various uh, practitioners needed to do in order to overcome those obstacles to implementation. So in each of the case studies, you'll actually find what the barriers were and the specific targeted answer that they give to those barriers. As I mentioned before, this last rendition of the GPD is um, jointly established by PACPA, the NDC support cluster, the UNDP um, NDC support program, LEDS Global Partnership, and the NDC partnership. It's accessible through all of our partner websites. Um, and as I mentioned, it's fully searchable. So if you're looking for something in just one country, you can go ahead and search by, search by country. You can also search by, um, by the action area that you're looking for. There are 200, over 200, I think I just looked and there are 220 case studies from across, across the globe. We have um, case studies that are available in English, French, and Spanish, and we will be um, posting more of the French and Spanish ones shortly. Um, and as I mentioned, you can search by countries, by regions, by action areas, planning and implementation activities, by themes, um, the barriers that are overcome, or the languages or the success factors. So the good practice, um, the, excuse me, the, the GPD actual case studies, as I mentioned, are, are through the, the joint collective of these various um, uh, collectives, the Partnership on Transparency and Paris Agreement, which I call PATPA, um, just kind of easily because we've been working together for years. But more important, or not more importantly, but I think very importantly is that um, there are a lot of institutions behind those that, that started this and are um, overseeing the work, but that are actually doing the interviews in country and developing the case studies, really getting into the details of what's taking place and making sure that it's translated into uh, um, a, a study that, that is easily um, accessible by all and that translates well. So we work specifically with Adelphi to do this, who is on the line and supporting this um, since the beginning. We also work with New Climate Institute, Libellula, um, the Energy Resource Institute, and CSE in Senegal. So just to give a little shout out to the fantastic work that they're doing to make sure that we're capturing this learning and translating it well. So first, um, I would like to hand over the screen to the two presenters that we have who will be talking about scaling up action and lessons learned from the British Columbia's carbon tax. I'll take a moment just to introduce these, these two guests so that you understand who is speaking. We are joined by Grant Hawley, who is the Director of Consumption Tax in the Tax Policy Branch of British Columbia's Ministry of Finance. His team is responsible for the provincial sales tax, carbon tax, motor fuel tax, excise tax, and other files. Prior to joining the tax policy branch, Grant worked in Treasury Board staff in the Ministry of Finance. Grant began his career in Canada's federal government in Ottawa, primarily at the Department of Finance. He studied at Carleton University, Queen's University, and the University of Montreal. Grant will also be joined by a colleague, Brian Murata, who is a strategic advisor in the tax policy branch of British Columbia's Ministry of Finance as well, where he's been since September 2017. Prior to joining the tax policy branch, Brian worked in several positions across various federal government departments, managing federal funding to nonprofits, promoting business development, developing innovation policy, and facilitating bilateral relations. He holds a master's in political science from Simon Fraser University and a bachelor's in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of British Columbia's um, Okanagan campus. <laughs> and they are also joined by two additional colleagues who won't necessarily be presenting, but they're going to join our question and answer session to provide us some of their expertise. So with that, I would like to invite Grant and Brian to take over my screen and go ahead and share their presentation with the whole webinar. This is our first handoff um, 
public. So let's see how well it goes. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. It's all yours. The floor is yours, Grant and Brian. I think you might actually be on mute. I, there, I, there we go. We uh, this is uh, Grant and Brian here in Victoria. And as mentioned, we're joined by Hugh Houston, the Director of Fuel and Carbon Tax, responsible for tax administration, as well as Ryan Katawaki, the Senior Economic Analyst at the Climate Action Secretariat in the Ministry of the Environment. So Elfie has shared with all of you a case study that analyzes the background and broader factors, such as the political environment, that impacted on the carbon taxes introduction and evolution here in British Columbia. The intent of our presentation is to describe the tax, to provide a bit of its history, to outline current public level support for it, and to conclude with some observations or lessons learned. All right, so just um, as a brief introduction, of course, the carbon tax was introduced in 2008, uh, 10 a ton was phased in, and it was actually North America's first broad-based carbon tax. So what does the carbon tax do? It provides a signal across the economy to reduce emissions while encouraging sustainable economic activity and investment in low carbon innovation. Sorry, this screen is not to allow us to move the presentation. We'll continue with the presentation, but unfortunately, we're Can not you just hit the right to... arrow. We, yep, on done, but unfortunately, it's not moving. It's on PDF. Slideshow. Oh, well, there we go. All right. So, uh, generally speaking, carbon tax applies to approximately 70% of BC coal emissions, such as transportation, on site combustion, mobile combustion, etc. Some sources of our emissions are not covered by the tax, such as fugitive sources, industrial, some industrial processes, agriculture, waste, and afforestation and deforestation. And of course, uh, in terms of taxes incidents, generally speaking, around 70% of the carbon tax is paid by businesses and industry, or around 27% is paid by individuals. And of course, those can fluctuate annually and around 3% is paid by governments at various levels. The tax base. The tax is paid by individuals and businesses that purchase or use fuel in the province, and it covers around 23 fuels and combustibles that are burned to produce our energy. So these cover, of course, gasoline, diesel, natural gas, and some of the combustibles include waste tires and peat. So tax is administrated through a security of the security team. It's paid downstream by users, but it's actually collected upstream by fuel producers or importers in most cases. Uh, certain fuels are not taxed, such as wood biomass, 100% uh, biomethane, non-energy emissions from agriculture waste, of course, as I previously mentioned, and jib emissions and non-combustible industrial emissions. And there are certain exemptions that, have, that exist, such as for interjurisdictional floods. Another thing is that Electricity in BC is not considered uh, taxable in carbon tax. An interesting point is that around 95% of BC's electricity is actually produced by uh, hydroelectricity. So I want to draw your attention to this chart. There's really two, you could call phases to the carbon taxes history. On the left side, you'll see phase one, and you'll see as of 2008, the carbon tax is implemented at $10 a ton, and then it gradually increased by five dollars a ton until hitting 30 at 2012. So phase one was the initial implementation of the carbon tax 2008 and the requirement for revenue neutrality as it was with the previous BC Liberal government. And this phase one really ends up to around the middle of 2017 with the formation of a new government. Now phase two, as you'll see on the right side of the chart, that represents not only the formation of a new government, but the gradual increase of the carbon tax beyond 30 dollars a ton as well as the ending of 
the requirement of a neutrality under the new government of the BC New Democratic Party and the Greens. So I'll talk a little bit about phase one. So the carbon tax, of course, as I've implemented, meant several times, implemented at $10 a ton in 2008 and gradually phased in until it hit $30 a ton in 2012. Now, there was a requirement for the tax to be revenue neutral, and this meant that measures were required to return revenues to British Columbia, so namely reductions in personal and corporate income taxes. And uh, this is generally demonstrated through the annual budget process. A carbon tax plan and report was included, and that estimated both carbon tax revenues and detailed the measures that offset revenues. And generally speaking, around 30% of the revenue offset measures were for individuals, and around 70% were businesses. And uh, yeah, an example of one of the revenue recycling measures is formerly known as the Low Income Climate Action Tax Credit. This is intended to help offset the impact of the taxes paid by individuals or families, and is based on the size of a family and adjusted family net income. So here's an example of the climate of the revenue neutral car tax plan and report from September 2017. That was actually the last report, which was uh, right under the revenue neutrality requirement. So the reason why I wanted to, or the reason why that there's a highlight in red is that was the aforementioned climate action tax credit that was considered a designated measure to return revenues to British Columbia's revenue neutrality requirement. So through that measure, governments have actually increased the amounts that have gone back to individuals and families that have generally gone alongside every time carbon tax has increased. The second part of the the Carbon Tax Planner Report details the business tax reduction measures. So in addition to things such as the reduction in the first two personal, personal income tax brackets as per previous slide, uh, other measures were things such as reducing the general corporate income tax rate, um, reduce small business corporate income tax rate, and increase corporate, corporate income tax small business threshold to $500,000. And there are other designated revenue offset measures such as the included tax credits that generally went towards business as well. So since the formation of a new government in uh, mid-2017, we've entered into phase two of the carbon tax. So in 2016, prior to the formation of the new government, BC joined the federal government and so the provinces and territories across Canada and into the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. Under this framework, provinces and territories are required to impose a car price equal to $50 a ton by 2022. So the new government that was formed in 2017, uh, again, referencing the budget that came out in September 2017, uh, this legislated the carbon tax increase by $5 a ton until reaching $50 a ton by 2021, which is actually one before the federally mandated requirement of $50 a ton by 2022. Uh, budget 2017 updated in September 2017 all limited revenue neutrality for future budget budgets with the end to allow government to spend revenues on emission reduction initiatives. So to support those priorities, the subsequent budget, budget 2018, outlined that government is taking a new approach to climate action and carbon pricing. Uh, new revenues associated with car tax increases would be directed towards three broad areas. Carbon tax relief for low and moderate income British Columbians, support for emissions intense industry to transition to a carbon economy and new green initiatives to grow innovation investment. And later on in 2018, government actually released its clean growth strategy, Clean BC, which outlined, I guess to say, the policy roadmap to achieve emission reductions targets. Now, in order to support those three areas, budget 2019 actually provided some funding to two of those areas. So for example, 220 million was provided over the budget plan to into climate action tax credit which goes towards providing that carbon tax relief for low and moderate income Colombians. But uh, the budget also provides around 168 million to the BC program for industry. Uh, that funds clean tax incentives to industrial operations, depending on how they perform relative to world leading emissions benchmarks and can go towards investments in emission reduction technologies. And that supports that second priority, support for emissions intense industry. So we found some, um, recent data that's come out, I guess, just in light of the election here in Canada. Uh, as of 2019, 
Around 40% of British Columbians believe government should use tax and incentives to reduce emissions and fight climate change. As you see by the highlighted part of that particular data set, only around 15% believe that neither should be used to neither should be used as tools to fight climate change. Interestingly enough, all three parties that are currently in the BC legislature are also supportive of carbon pricing. So there doesn't seem to be a, a risk of the carbon tax being repealed in BC. So a couple of concluding slides. The first is about our high level timeline or storyline. As you'll see, uh, revenue neutrality was important to implementing the carbon tax back in 20 or 2008. Uh, the importance of revenue neutrality decreased over time in part due to greater acceptability of the tax and concerns regarding revenue neutrality reporting. The new government elected in 2017 eliminated revenue neutrality and rather committed to spend a portion of new revenues on green initiatives, three that Brian mentioned in particular. There remains a strong desire for accountability how carbon tax revenues are spent. In fact, under Clean BC, government is committed to transparent, forward-looking, and independent public reporting, and that's something that's still being worked on. So the case study that was circulated to all of you includes lessons learned, as well as guidance for other jurisdictions on how to replicate BC's carbon tax. Here we offer four observations. One, if you use revenue recycling, focus on fairness, for both individuals and business, as well as business competitiveness. Secondly, clearly define your objectives, and Brian mentioned those on the second slide of our presentation. Three, use a portfolio of approaches, so tax actions as well as spending. And four, priorities should be adjusted over time, and we've seen that with the two phases here in British Columbia. With that, uh, thank you, and we look forward to your questions. Great, thank you. Sorry for the delay. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for giving us the overview. Um, I had the privilege of, of reading the, the case study and I really think that, that others should be reading it as well to get more of the in-depth information, but maybe we'll get into that a little bit in the question and answer session. Um, let me just go ahead and get my screen up here again. Um, apologies for this. There we go. Um, technical difficulties here. Um, and I will just go ahead and I'd like to introduce our colleague from Fiji, um, who will to be talking about scaling up ambition. Um, excuse me, I'm not speaking on the right um, screen here. So pioneering green finance in the developing world and talking specifically about the Fijian um, sovereign bond. Um, I'd like to welcome our colleague Vanil Narayan. Vanil is a climate finance specialist with the Climate Change and International Cooperation Division of the Ministry of Economy. He has previously worked as an economist and rose through the ranks to become the senior economist with the Budget and Planning Division of the Ministry of Economy, looking after the Fijian government's infrastructure budget. Mr. Nairayan has completed his fifth year with the ministry in 2019. He was the lead representative from the Ministry of Economy responsible for selecting eligible projects for Fiji's first ever sovereign green bond issuance and is also responsible for programming, monitoring, evaluating and reporting on Fiji's environment and climate adaptation levy. He has contributed to various national planning and policy documents and has keen interest in development of green investment projects. Um, we are very pleased to have you here with us today to share what your experiences and learning are. And with that, I will go ahead and invite you to take over the screen with your presentation. Welcome, Benio. Hi, thank, thank you, everyone. Um, give me a second while I just shoot Please. up the, uh, the screen. All right, I hope everyone can see the screen now. Um, 
Excellent. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to participate in this uh, webinar, and I thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak on, um, uh, on, on Fiji's uh, sovereign green bonds. Now, as I mentioned, uh, my presentation today will be on Fiji's first ever sovereign green bond issuance. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Fiji is an archipelago of just under 900,000 people si situated in the South Pacific. Now, having said that, um, let's get right into the presentation. Um, I would just like to give you a brief overview of Fiji's uh, perspective on climate change. Um, in particular, climate change is no longer um, only a moral and ethical issue for us. It is now an economic imperative as well. This means that climate change has become the single greatest threat to Fiji's development aspirations and is one of the main underlying reasons for poverty and limited socioeconomic prosperity for us. In this regard, Fiji is, almost, uh, is amongst the most uh, climate vulnerable small island developing states uh, in the world, despite being amongst the lowest contributors to greenhouse, em greenhouse gas emissions. As the world enters into an age of unparalleled increase in global average temperatures, the intensity and frequency of cyclones continue to increase um, sea level rise, uh, which threaten low-lying low communities with it thousands of years of cultural and, and traditional values. Salt water intrusion is turning once fertile land barren while cutting issues such as, while cross-cutting issues such as uh, food insecurity and vector borne diseases compound um, socioeconomic vulnerabilities. All of which are major climate induced development challenges for Fiji. So naturally, adaptation is a national priority which underpins Fiji's mantra that development finance is climate finance. Fiji has developed its uh, national adaptation plan undertaken a comprehensive climate vulnerability assessment and clearly communicated its adaptation needs. We now look forward to, 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 to the climate finance world for innovative homegrown financing solutions um, and fast track access to international climate financing um, and greater emphasis on grant and concessional financing from multilateral sources and also reducing the, the cost of accessing climate finance. Now, having said that, let's take a closer look at uh, Fiji's climate finance space. Like most small island developing states, Fiji's climate finance needs far outweigh current climate finance flows. As I just mentioned, we have undertaken a climate vulnerability assessment, which you can see on the left of your screen, uh, which informs that Fiji requires approximately 4.6 billion US dollars to fortify its development aspirations as outlined in our five year and 20 year national development plan. We also take our commitment to the Paris Agreement seriously and continue to invest in a renewable and low carbon future for Fiji. In this regard, we have developed the NDC implementation roadmap, which you see on the right of your screen, that is env envisaged to help Fiji de deliver on its decarbonization commitments under the Paris Agreement. The roadmap estimates that, that approximately US 2.97 billion is required to implement Fiji's mitigation ambitions. Now, these are just two of the six national documents uh, that have been developed over the past three years, but they are the only ones that have been extensively costed and helps to get a picture of Fiji's vast climate finance needs. With that quick overview, let's quickly look at Fiji's major uh, climate finance flows before we begin to discuss the green bonds. By undertaking a desktop analysis of Fiji's major climate finance flows from 2010 to 2018, the Climate Change and International Cooperation Division estimates that Fiji has managed to secure just over US 122 million in domestic and international climate finance over the past eight years. This is broken down into four main sources, which are the Environmental and Climate Adaptation Levy. Uh, basically, it's a consortium of, uh, of taxes on plastic bags, fuel intensive personal vehicles, super yachts, um, highest year of income earnings and luxury goods and services. The next being the Green Climate Fund. Uh, we were one of the very first countries in the world to receive grant financing by, by the, from, from the Green Climate Fund for the urban water and wastewater management project, which is expected to benefit approximately 300,000 people in the most populous region of Fiji, which is in, 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 near the capital of Fiji. The next, the third rather, is the Global Environment Facility. Um, the grant funding that we have received from, from the Global Environment Facility is for various renewable energy capacity building and ecosystem uh, conservation initiatives. And lastly, the Adaptation Fund, 
we have just recently secured um, uh, funding of just over US 4.2 million um, for a five-year project targeted towards increasing the disaster and climate, climate resilience of informal urban settlements in Fiji. Now, in this regard, um, and, and having this, uh, this, this broad overview of Fiji's climate finance flows, um, it is needless to say that uh, greater climate finance solutions are required to bridge the gap between Fiji's climate finance, finance needs and climate finance flows. In particular, there is an urgent need to mobilize private sector and in, in, in private sector investments into climate change as well. In this regard, Fiji took a proactive approach to explore innovative climate finance solutions after various discussions. Um, it was decided that Fiji would explore market-based mechanisms through the green bonds, which I will now discuss now. Now, I will just quickly dwell into the functional mechanisms of Fiji's green bonds. In 2017, Fiji became the first developing country and the first small island developing state to issue a sovereign green bond amounting to US $50 million. As part of its 2017-2018 national budget, the Fijian government announced its plans to issue a US $50 million green bond to finance projects that are sustainable, respect the environment, and address the impacts of climate change. Immediately after this, a green bond steering committee was established. This was a high level committee chaired by the governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji and comprised of high ranking officials from the climate change division, the treasury division and the solicitor general's office. The committee was also given technical backstopping by the International Financing Corporation, a arm of the World Bank. The committee spearheaded the development or the successful development of the Fiji green bond framework, which set out the strategic focus of current and forthcoming green bond issuances for Fiji. It basically gave an overarching framework that clearly communicates how Fiji defines green bonds and gives broad clarity to investors. The, the steering committee also undertook necessary preparatory work, which included the development of the green bond prospectus, which outlined the specifics of Fiji's first ever green bond issuance and was the main source of information for investors as they were investing into the bond. In particular, the prospectus outlined three main caveats to uh, qualify projects as eligible for green bond funding, which can be found on page six of Fiji's green bond impact, uh, green bond impact report. The link is provided uh, on the screen um, for, for time and space. I did not list them. Um, basically, these uh, quickly going over these three caveats. The first uh, um, caveat was that eligible projects must be programmed in the national budget. So all projects that were funded in the green bond were supposed to be funded through the government's national budget. The second um, caveat was that eligible projects must fall under either one or more eligible sectors outlined in the Fiji Green Bond Framework, which was developed by the Green Bond Steering Committee. And the final um, caveat was that eligible project components should not be funded by any other financing mechanisms of the Fijian government. Now, the prospectus uh, or the Green Bond prospectus also outlined that the Fijian government would offer the bond issuances in two terms a five-year term for, for a coupon rate of 4% and a 13-year term for a coupon rate of 6.3%. The prospectus also outlined how the Fijian government as the bond issuer would use the fungibility of money principle to put aside an advance of 50 million into a ring fenced account, which would be used to finance eligible green projects. This account would then be replenished as the green bond was issued in four tranches. The prospectus placed a string of obligations as well on the Fijian government, which included um, the audit of the use of green bond proceeds and as well as issuing of, of annual investor reports. Now with that overview, um, let me just um, um, give you a brief sort of timeline perspective of what, I've, what all I've just mentioned. So like I mentioned in 2017, um, the, on, in July 2017 rather, the budget announcement was made that Fiji would be um, uh, investing into a, uh, into a green bonds. Immediately after, on, uh, in the same month in July, the green bond steering committee was developed. And the green bond steering committee um, in August 2017 uh, developed the Fiji green bond framework. Now, once the framework was developed, um, the Fijian government uh, mined its national budget to pick out eligible green projects uh, as per the, 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 the caveats that, that it had placed itself on. And basically, once these projects were identified, uh, we developed a comprehensive prospectus, which was then socialized with investors. 
Now, uh, before the prospectus went into market, um, when, before we went into market to issue the green bond, we actually had to take a, a second opinion from a reputable international um, green uh, bond firm or green accreditation firm, which was Sustainalytics. This basically enabled us to um, have more credibility to our bond issuances and allowed us to have a lower risk um, on, on our bond issuances, which ultimately trans translated into a lower um, coupon right that we had to issue. So um, the, all that happened up until September 2017. And from November 2017, we began to issue um, the, the green bond in four tranches. Um, it went all the way up until um, July 2018. Um, between that term, we also listed the green bond um, on the London Stock Exchange to basically give us more greater access to larger pool of funding. Um, after all the the, the uh, funds had been dispersed, we undertook a third party audit um, by by an independent audit firm, just to give credibility to how we had used um, the the green bonds, and basically that resulted and ultimately resulted in the first green bond impact report, um, which uh, which has which has been published onto the Reserve Bank of Fiji's website. Now, this slide basically gives a quick overview of projects that had been funded or seven key projects that had been funded by through the green bond. Um, they they cross, uh, cross cut across various, uh, various sectors. Um, the first is uh, basically providing clean water supply through the Water Authority of Fiji. Um, the next is cyclone rehabilitation. Um, Fiji in 2016 suffered the largest um, cyclone to ever hit or make landfall in the Southern Hemisphere, which uh, destroyed one third of our GDP. So we actually um, um, use the green bond to finance our rebuild um, efforts. The next is, uh, is funding. The funding went to Fiji Roads Authority for emergency works. Um, in addition to that, uh, the funding also went to um, improving um, access to energy for rural communities, as well as uh, forest conservation and sustainable waste management. All this total to 100 million uh, Fijian dollars, which translate to US 50 million dollars. Now, Fiji's green bond issuance, uh, like I said, was done in, in four tranches. This table basically gives um, an overview of how those issuances were made or done. Um, largely, uh, largely these these issuances um, um, helped helped uh, Fiji to to have access to greater pool of funding. Um, as you can see from 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 the table, rather um, the the bond issuances um, um, when when they were they were they were uh, taken to market, we actually received close to over 162.4 million uh, worth of uh, of uh, investor interest for a bond that was just 100 million. So basically, in in, in short and simple terms, the bond was oversubscribed and uh, and there was extremely huge interest from from investors because they actually understood what the Fijian government was. Uh, Planning to do, and uh, in terms in terms of uh, moving towards more sustainable, cleaner um, future for Fiji. Now, um, I'd just like to broadly um, explain what are some key success points um, that that uh, we found in our issuance. The first was that there was strong political momentum, um, and and the next was that there was unprecedented investments in climate change and environmental conservation projects. This never happened before. Uh, Fiji um, had never issued a green bond um, and, and basically private sector interest in the green bond sector was close to none or close to zero. The next uh, was that uh, by, by through the issuances or issuance of the green bond, there was a clear message sent, sent to the private sector and the world that Fiji is serious about its um, green ambitions and going green. The next is that, and as I just mentioned, that the green bond was issued in, in, in a phased approach in four phases. And this basically gave us an advantage to basically test out the market with subsequent um, um, issuances. Um, we were able to sort of target um, right investors and promote uh, the green bonds in the right space. And this resulted, as I just mentioned, in the oversubscription of the green bonds. The next was that there was strong stakeholder engagement. Um, not only within government, but outside government as well. This enabled greater awareness on what the green bond did and what uh, what it was uh, uh, expected to do in the future in terms of raising unprecedented climate finance for Fiji. And lastly, there was excellent technical support from IFC. Um, basically, Fiji uh, ventured into its first ever green bond um, without having um, 
desktop and or full on technical um, experience on, on how to issue this bond. So we um, relied on the IFC to give us some technical backstopping and that basically was a strong factor for us to um, issue, successfully issue our green bonds. Now, um, the green bonds in terms of, of what it has done and what uh, it is expected to do in terms of benefits, it has benefited close to about uh, 129,300 Fijians directly. It has helped to reduce about 1,919 uh, 1, tons of carbon emissions and has actually enabled um, access to 20,000 liters of clean water per day in rural areas. It has helped to also rebuild close to 1,283 1, um, public buildings and school buildings. It has also um, enabled us to um, create 1.3 million um, kilowatt hours of clean renewable electricity in rural areas. We have also managed to plant 2001 trees um, and uh, we have also managed to also uh, rehabilitate uh, 176 bridges. Um, the rehabilitation of schools, uh, by the way, has also benefited close to 33,209 students as well. So just moving in, into some key challenges and some key um, um, obstacles that, that we had uh, faced and we would like to share. Um, the first is uh, creating a business case for, for green bonds. Basically, investors compare coupon returns between normal bonds, term deposits, and share investments. So a green bond must offer competitive returns to generate market interest. Um, in addition to that, uh, we, also, uh, want, uh, we also faced issues in terms of reducing the cost of accessing finance. So basically, being a small island developing state, Fiji must be cognizant of how a bond, which is ultimately a debt instrument, will affect the national debt structure. While coupon rates must be competitive, it must not create unsustainable debt servicing costs as well. The next was that we, we needed to overcome market unfamiliarity as well. As I mentioned, green bonds is actually an unprecedented monetary mechanism for Fiji, which um, um, supported unorthodox projects that were unfamiliar um, for, the, for the private sector. Um, this makes investors very, uh, uh, very risk averse and reluctant to invest in uh, a market mechanism that the investment mantra is not familiar to. And lastly, um, they, we, we found difficulty in establishing a robust and monitoring evaluation capability. Um, the Pacific, like many small island developing states, are limited by many capabilities, which hinder the quality of report back to investors. So green bonds require a high level of reporting on technical climate change indicators, which are difficult to adhere to um, uh, in, in, due to inherent institutional and uh, technical capacity limitations. Having said all that, um, the issuance of, of the green bonds has actually given us um, confidence to move into um, the, the, the market-based mechanisms for climate finance solutions uh, in the future. And basically that has given us confidence to enter into more innovative climate bond solutions. We are, looking, we are now looking at blue bonds basically to help preserve our oceans. We're looking at catastrophic bonds and resilient bonds as well. Um, we have also um, had discussions on private bond issuances as well. We are looking towards our state-owned entity to, um, to um, go green through bond issuances, um, uh, state-owned electricity entity rather. Um, uh, so this is actually a tried and proven example that the World Bank has actually helped facilitate in Thailand as well. Um, and we, we hope to sort of emulate that success uh, in Fiji. So just quickly, some concluding points, and this is something that I picked up uh, um, during a workshop that was organized by the Asian Development Bank on green bonds. Um, some, some key fundamental um, 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 prerequisites that need to be in place for a successful issuance of green bonds. The first is that there needs to be sufficient investment grade green assets already in operation or planned with positive cash flows. This basically gives far greater confidence to, um, to, to the private sector to invest in, in, in uh, green bonds. Um, there also needs to be supply of willing issuers. So what that means is uh, for Fiji, for, in Fiji, for example, um, the first ever issuer was the Fijian government, but we want to build capacity in the private sector as well as in, in NGO spaces to also issue green bonds um, and, and move into this innovative climate financing space. Um, the next is that there is, there is a need for sufficient demand for, from large and diverse pool of investors to actually buy in um, the bonds, um, if, if we issue the bonds and there's no one to buy them, then of, of course it, it just negates the purpose of, of the bonds per se. Um, in addition, um, we also need awareness, far-reaching um, far awareness on the benefits and applicable guidelines and standards for green bond issuances as well. 
And lastly, we need an experienced pool of verifiers and assurance providers that actually help us to um, quality check our green bond issuances and basically give us um, a, a rubber stamp of approval, which would ultimately help us to um, get lower interest rates in the market and, and, and go into the market at a more affordable term. So that basically um, wraps up my presentation and I look forward to questions and answers. Great, thank you very, very much. Um, that was really helpful and I think um, extremely interesting, especially um, juxtaposed with, with the British Columbia example. Um, let me just go ahead and bring my screen back um, so that I can invite all attendees to go ahead and um, start asking their questions um, in the question box. Um, as mentioned previously, at the bottom of your screen, there is a question box um, where if you have any questions that you would want to put towards the um, presenters, you can go ahead and type the question in there, um, and then I will go ahead and read it out um, so that they can hear. And just reminding people that um, from British Columbia, we have a number of people Joining us, um, um, joining us as well as Ryan um, Katowaki, who is there to answer specific questions um, on the carbon tax in British Columbia. Um, maybe to start, actually, I'll just go ahead and, um, and ask a question myself to Grant, Brian, Hugh, and Ryan. Um, it's, it's kind of a general one, but in reading over the, um, the actual case study, um, I saw that you mentioned that there are a few in ingredients to successfully launch a climate tax, and that included like stakeholder engagement, political buy-in, favorable business sector, um, high-level support. And I'm just curious if there were a country, someone listening right now, um, looking down the, the tunnel and, and wanting to go ahead and start on the first step of what um, they should do in order to start going down this route in their country, what would you suggest is, is where their energy should focus? Is it stakeholder engagement? Is it the high level political buy-in? Um, is it a legislative framework? Um, is there something that you would suggest as just the first start? Um, this is Hugh Hughes, and I'll speak to that. And uh, my recollection as we were going through it, we had, we were doing all of those things uh, concurrently. We were consulting with industry, we were building the farms, we were building a legislation. Um, it took us approximately six months to introduce it. Um, so we were, I, I think there were multiple things that ministry staff, government were working on, again, concurrently to get it implemented as quickly as possible. Understood, thank you. So coming in all directions, great. Um, and then we have a question again for British Columbia that's coming specifically um, from an attendee. And the attendee asks, um, how, has, how in British Columbia have you decided to end revenue neutrality? Um, when a government assured the support of public for the tax by surveys or some other ways? Um, so with respect to um, the end of revenue neutrality, um, in 2017, a new government was formed under the New Democratic Party, supported by the Green Party. And it was part of their first budget that they announced that um, revenue neutrality, we would no longer report on revenue neutrality. And then in the subsequent budget, which was um, be half a year later, they announced their priorities in terms of how they would send incremental carbon tax revenues that were raised as a result of increases they had announced. Um, in terms of assuring support, um, the tax has existed here now for 10 plus years. Um, so there is um, pretty widespread acceptance of the tax at this point, I would say. Um, so um, I think that um, in terms of, of maintaining support for the tax, they do that in part by um, trying to be as transparent as possible in how carbon tax revenues are being spent and ensuring that the balance between 
uh, fairness and competitiveness um, are maintained. Great, thank you very much. Um, and then maybe I'll just turn turn the the question over to um, Vanille and asks something somewhat similar to the first question that I asked um, to our colleagues in British Columbia. Um, there are a number of different steps that you mentioned about um, establishing the green bond. I'm wondering um, if there's something as a first step that you would suggest to um, to participants if they're going down that route. Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I would say that the first step would be to ascertain what are your climate finance needs or what are your financing needs in the first place so that you are able to identify the right um, market mechanism, the right um, financing tool to actually um, take up. So, for example, the British Columbia has taken a carbon tax uh, approach. PG has taken a um, green bond approach. Um, there's there's multiple approaches as well uh, available in, in, in the market uh, but basically the most important part is that you actually ascertain what are your needs um, PG has actually as I mentioned done that through various uh, national studies and reports and assessments um, we find that other Pacific countries um, are actually struggling in that part um, they they have not identified what are their um, financing needs at the moment so so it, it becomes slightly difficult for them to um, identify what are the appropriate um, mechanisms or tools to actually use to raise uh, financing. So um, that would be that would be my, my answer to that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why exactly, um, given the different mechanisms that Fiji decided to go for the green bond? So uh, the green bonds was an initiative of Fiji's uh, COP23 presidency. Uh, uh -huh. uh, we actually wanted to move towards more sustainable um, uh, financing approaches and more green financing approaches and actually uh, practice what we would be preaching through our presidency um, and uh, basically uh, our reserve bank of uh, our reserve bank rather um, had various experience in, in issuing uh, bonds and basically it was a familiar territory for us we actually knew what was our financing needs because of the assessments that we had already um, done as i just showed in my presentation so um, a bond issuance was actually familiar territory for fiji and we thought that um, a green bond um, um, would be the best approach because uh, we also took some um, some market studies as well and showed that the green bond market, global green bond market, has actually grown substantive, substantively from 2010, uh, reaching up to close to about 100 billion um, uh, dollar mark in, in, in the global arena. And we thought that it was a proven um, um, in, um, tool and, and we were familiar with it, confident with it, and when we took it. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm curious if you have any insight on who, who exactly is buying the bond. So the bonds uh, are actually uh, bought, at least PG's bond is, uh, was bought from uh, by uh, domestic finances, uh, basically banks and provident funds, mm -hmm. a large uh, venture capitalists as well. Uh, okay. We had a couple of, uh, of uh, foreign investors as well um, that we secured through uh, through our listing of the bond onto the uh, London Stock Exchange. So basically, okay. as I mentioned in my presentation, we actually had access to um, a larger pool of international financiers. So those were some private venture companies as well who, who went into this investment. Great, thank you. Um, and then I'd like to go back to British Columbia and just um, ask a somewhat similar question. Um, why why did, did British Columbia decide to opt for a carbon tax as opposed to cap and trade or, or something um, else? Hey there, uh, this Hi. is Hugh. We're going back, going back ten plus years now. So okay, I'm yeah, <laughs> <laughs> noted. <laughs> As per the paper, I think it was really the interest of the premier of British Columbia at that particular time that was spearheaded that initiative. Okay. People were talking about climate change, but it was the premier that I think really pushed it. And I would credit probably the uh, strategic policy staff with coming up with the revenue neutrality concept, which made it, uh, I think, a very publicly acceptable model. Great. 
Thank you. That's interesting. Um, and uh, along that line, I'm, I'm curious to know um, if both both of the, the countries, if you could speak to maybe how how you get that political support and, and even more importantly, like how you get all of the stakeholders together um, and in with the political support, especially with, I mean, with taxes, for instance, um, the carbon neutrality um, aspect presumably brought, as you said, the people in, um, but, but how, I mean, how did, how did that get, you get the political support to begin with from the premier? Uh, this is Hugh. I'm not sure I can answer it, but again, it's back to the premier. There was no other model mm -hmm. carbon taxes in North America that was so broad based. There was no federal interest and so the world has changed, I think, from DC's perspective since this was first discussed in uh, 2007. A carbon tax was first discussed in 2007. Mm -hmm. The circumstances aren't repl replicatable, I don't think, from that mm -hmm. perspective. Understood. Um, at least, well, if I can weigh in on that for Fiji, um, it wasn't very difficult to sort of create that political momentum because. Um, like I, like I mentioned in my presentation, we're, we're at the forefront of climate change. Um, we could actually see the impacts of climate change and and uh, and uh, having sea level rise affecting various communities. Um, it was a no-brainer uh, for for politicians and leaders to actually address that for people. Um, but in in general, I, I would like to say that uh, um, it's it's important to translate the urgency of of climate change action. Into a more political, politically acceptable terms. Um, for example, um, if if, um, if if communities are being relocated due to sea level rise, um, it is an obvious um, no-brainer that uh, that politicians would actually want to address that. Um, and and the political view and political drive towards addressing climate change just automatically comes. And uh, I think. Um, that is where Fiji and the Pacific is at an advantage because our leaders are already singing the tune and and uh, they actually seeing firsthand what are the impacts of climate change on on their people. So um, I think I think we're lucky in that sense. Yeah, understood. Um, great. We have one more question in um, from the the participants that I would like to um, pose to the Neil. Um, the question is to follow up um, on my previous question about your preference for green bond. Why did Fiji um, didn't choose the easiest way, um, which is funding its investments from the GCF? Is there a reason? I mean, even more so, instead of just going with the GCF or some sort of grant funding, that you decided to go ahead um, with the green bond? And she goes on to say that just because they saw potential in this promising market to do green bonds. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would have two points to that. Uh, to that. To that question. The first is that um, we we have actually moved into. Um, or sought GCF funding in, in the past. And that has taken to some extent, and with all due respect to GCF processes, uh, longer <laughs> yeah. than, than we than, yeah, yeah. Longer than we would like. <laughs> um, and, and basically a green bond issuance is, and, and the second point to my answer is that the green bond issuance is, is more of a market signal than a, a full on um, fully understood uh, financial investment. Basically, by making this green bond issuance, we sent key messages to the private sector that this is an approach that the Fijian government would be taking in the future. Um, this is something that we feel um, is is essential uh, for us to move towards in raising um, private financing. Um, having said that, in terms of the cost advantage, um, I, I would in all honesty say that uh, compared to traditional bond issuances like treasury bond, bond issuances that Fiji does, um, the green bond issuance was actually slightly more expensive for us, um, given the fact that, uh, that I mentioned in my presentation that we had issued the bond in two tranches. The first was uh, for a five-year term of 4%. That is almost similar to our normal treasury bond. But the second um, issuance, which was for 13 years, we issued it at around, we issued the green bond at around 6.3% while our normal bond issuance is at around almost 5%. So we actually had to pay more um, in the market uh, to actually get um, investors in. But th that that 1% difference or 1% more in terms of what we paid actually brought in far greater 
um, um, uh, emphasis on Fiji's uh, Fiji's climate ambitions. It brought in uh, great uh, traction in terms of our climate financing needs. So, so we we thought and we ultimately knew that this was the best approach to take. Great, thank you for that. Um, and we have, sorry, another question coming in from a participant. Why was it a good idea for Fiji to introduce the green in four tranches? So, to, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, uh, the reason why we introduced the bonds in four trenches was that uh, we wanted to test out the market and see what was the appetite for, for Fiji's green bond. Um, as I mentioned, we, we had never done this before and we, are, we were only at that point in time, only the third country in the world to um, issue a green bond, so uh, a sovereign green bond rather. And, and um, it, it was an unfamiliar territory and we wanted to sort of test the market first and see what was the demand like um, if we were to sort of tweak interest rates or coupon rates to better attract uh, financiers, then that would be an option that we would take in subsequent issuances. So basically, it was just to test out the market and 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 uh, help us to um, bite on something that was more chewable in terms of technicalities of, of of the dynamics of the green bond market, the changing dynamics of the green bond market. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I think actually with that, um, recognizing that we've come to time and there are, are no more questions um, popping up in the question box, um, I would like to thank our presenters um, and then also let the attendees know um, that if you found this interesting, if you're looking for more um, case studies um, on different topics, we really suggest that you check out the um, good practice database, but as well, you're welcome to go to past presentations from this series of webinars. Um, that we held, as I mentioned, this was the fourth. We did one earlier on horizontal integration, specifically on how countries can follow a multi-sectoral approach to achieving their NDC targets. We also did one on integrating agendas where two countries spoke about aligning the SDGs and the NDC implementation at the country level, looking specifically at indicators and um, strategy alignment. And then we did one on engaging the private sector for reaching their NDC targets. Um, and all of these can be found on the PAPPA site, as well as the UNDP site. Um, so we encourage you to go ahead and check those out if you have any interest. And with that, I would just like to thank everyone for their participation. Um, a very special thank you to Grant, Brian, Hugh, and Ryan for your presentation, and then for the question and answer session, as well as to Vanil for all of the great information that you gave us from the Pacific. Um, I'd also like to thank our colleagues from Adelphi who have managed to put this all together, the entire series, um, and be in the background navigating um, this platform. It was really a joy to, to work with you and to have you along um, supporting us through this endeavor. Um, thank you all for joining please go ahead and visit the Transparency Partnership website um, and get more information about case studies and lots of learning. Um, thank you all for joining and I wish you all a good evening and a good night and a good day wherever you are. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.